Hello and welcome to the History of the Germans, episode 67. Germany around 1200. The peasants. Yes, you heard right. This is about the peasants. No kings, emperors, popes, bishops at all. Okay, one brother of a duke at the very end of the podcast, because I simply can't help myself. But, yes, peasants. What was the life of a peasant like in Germany in around 1200? How much do we actually know about their living conditions? Did it differ much from country to country? Correct answer to all of these is, well, we're not exactly sure. These sections of the podcast are always the hardest ones. Following some king or emperor around is fairly straightforward. That's what the sources are focused on, and you can compare them as well as the different interpretations, and then you get a half-decent picture of what's likely to have happened. But nobody has written a chronicle of what poor Michael, sharecropper on the lands of the Count of Fullendorf, been up to, let alone was there a second chronicler who looked at the same thing from the perspective of the Count. We have to look at the variety of sources that are usually aimed at describing something entirely different, therefore. Archaeology is also crucial, as is the Sachsenspiegel, a compilation of Germanic laws of the 12th century. And the bits in the middle are made up, I'm afraid. But before we start, as always a reminder, the History of the Germans podcast is advertising free, thanks to the generous support from patrons. And you can become a patron too, and enjoy exclusive bonus episodes and other privileges from the price of a latte per month. All you have to do is sign up at patreon.com slash History of the Germans, or on my website, historyofthegermans.com. you find all the links in the show notes. And thanks a lot to all of you who've already signed up, especially to Priska, Laura, and Simon. Simon's the northernmost listener of this podcast, as far as I know. So if you think you may be further north than northern Norway, let me know, and you get a special mention. Now, when we did this last time, we looked at Germany in the year 1000. Quite a bit has changed, but not the most important thing. The economy, stupid. We are still in this almost 400 year long economic boom time that started around 950 and lasted until 1348, the year that the Black Death descended upon Europe. This economic boom has been a combination of climate change that broadened the range of land available for agriculture and also the kinds of crops that could be planted. It was further driven by improvement in agricultural technology, namely the turning plough, this not only breaks the earth, but also forces the nutrients up from below. And then to pull the plough, peasants increasingly exchanged slow-moving oxen with the much faster horses, thanks to the shoulder collar, another recent invention. And then the three-field system replaces the two-field system, so that reduces the amount of fallow land from half to just one-third. The three-field system would remain the dominant technology until Johann Jakob Meyer promoted the reform of crop rotation and fertilization in the 18th century. What we did not have yet in the year 1000 was the next big boost to growth, widespread forest clearing. When the Romans arrived on the Rhine River, they found the lands on the eastern bank almost entirely covered by huge and impenetrable forest. Some had been cleared during the Carolingian period, from around 500 to about 800, but that was mostly near the main Roman cities. Real large-scale clearing of the forests in the centre of the country began in the middle of the 11th century. For instance, the Black Forest, which is just across the river from the Roman city of Strasbourg, was almost completely uninhabited before 1100. Mining was one of the very few reasons why people would venture amongst the trees. As they cleared the woods, mainly because they needed it to melt the metals out of the ore, agriculture began and villages were settled. A lot of pioneering was done by monasteries, especially the Cistercians, who were looking for seclusion to focus on Ora et Labora. Whilst the Black Forest is still very much covered in trees, other areas were completely cleared. For instance, the poor soil around Lüneburg in the north were once covered in forests. A combination of salt mining and settled agriculture gradually turned it into the heathland it's now so famous for. Today, one third of Germany is covered in forest. However, that's largely due to the creation of forestry management in the 19th century. By that time, forests had shrunk to no more than the hunting grounds of the aristocracy and some patches of forest maintained by the inefficient monasteries. The dramatic shortage of wood as heating material forced the rethinking, and the poorest agricultural land was replanted, mostly with fast-growing conifers. Of the medieval forest of Oak and Elm, not much is left. This improvement in agricultural technology and available land 
translated into a material increase in population, estimated to be around threefold across Europe between 1000 and 1340. That is not contested. What is contested is the question whether it resulted in any improvement in the living standards of the peasants. Chris Wickham points to archaeology to prove that villages in the 12th century had become better planned and better built than 200 years earlier. In Italy, wood construction is replaced by stone, and in the north, where wood was very readily available, more complex wooden constructions and elaborate timber frames point to increased prosperity. Equally, we find evidence of metal tools and dress ornaments supporting this thesis. What limited the expansion of peasant wealth were the ever-increasing demands from landlords for more and more dues, be it for justice, the use of pasture or the access to woodland. By around now, outright slavery had ended. Serfdom in the form of owing work to the landlord was also in retreat. Starting from the 11th century, peasants' rents were increasingly determined and sometimes paid in cash. Silver was mined in Goslar and subsequently more deposits were found in Saxony and Bohemia. Still, silver values were high and so they were more of a measurement tool than a genuine means of exchange. The advantage of monetary rent for the landlord was that cash was a lot easier to move around. If you were receiving rents as wheat or hogs, you would need to be either consume it on the spot or bring it to a market, which requires manpower and organization. Now, the great advantage for the peasant was that a monetary obligation was transparent. A penny was a penny, and if you owed four pennies in rent, there was no ambiguity what you owed. If you owed a day of work on the fields of the Lord, there is the question of, when does the day start? When does it end? What happens if the work's done shoddily? On what day is that work to be done, etc., etc., pp. Money is so much better. In particular, when the obligations are written down on a piece of paper, the peasant can then show at the court of the local count. The other reason why peasants saw an improvement in their living conditions had to do with the growing number of alternatives. When the tide comes in, all boats float up. In this time of economic boom, a tenant, unhappy with his lot in life, can find somewhere else to go. The lord, who has just cleared the forest in his territories looking for settlers, and is prepared to offer lenient conditions and protection. Cities there want to grow offer freedom to everyone who can hold out for a year and a day. And new cities are being founded left, right and center. And then there is the big one, the colonization of the East. By 1130, the lands between the Elbe and the Oder River, roughly equivalent to the modern states of Mecklenburg-Vorpommern, Brandenburg, Saxony and Sachsen-Anhalt, were sparsely populated by Slavic peoples, many of whom were pagans. Beginning with Lothar III, the Saxon dukes invited colonists to settle in these lands under their protection. We'll talk about this in more detail in the next season and I need to learn a lot more about the fate of the original population, so I will not make any comment specifically on that. But for the purposes of what we talk about now, the important thing is that these colonists were offered generous terms to go into these dangerous lands. Thanks to the Sachsenspiegel, the compilation of Germanic laws written down in 1220 by Eike von Repgo, we have a fairly detailed picture on how these new villages were set up. During the period from 1134 to 1320, the authorities will have found 2,500 villages in the Margraviat of Brandenburg alone, creating homes for an estimated 200,000 individuals. The foundation of a village begins with the appointment of a locator, an official appointed by either the local prince, the church or an aristocrat. The locator will then go out and recruit peasant families from as far away as Flanders or southern Germany, but mostly locally. A village would usually require between 6 and 20 families of free peasants, plus a number of landless free labourers, so-called Cossetten, and a vicar. The free peasants held the non-arable land in common. That means the surrounding woods, grazing lands and ponds and rivers were managed jointly. The three-field approach meant that the land was divided into three parcels. Each of those would then be planted in rotation in line with the three-field method. These parcels would be cut into strips, and a peasant would, in, for example, hold two strips, so that he would own two strips in each of the large parcels. The free peasant would not own the land, but would hold it as an inheritable leasehold from the lord of the manor. Hence, he would have to pay rent. That rent was described in the Sachsenspiegel as an obligation in kind, 
namely to deliver lambs on St. Walpurgis in May, fruit and wine in late May, in June meat, wheat in July, geese in August, and cash and miscellaneous on St. Bartholomew's Day. In the case of Brandenburg, it seems the landlords preferred obligations in kind to cash since they could sell those to the Hanse cities nearby, probably more profitably. The peasants were also obliged to use the lord's mill at a price the lord could determine. Once the village is established, the locator would usually become the Burmeister, or Schulze. That means he would dispense the lower justice and generally organize village life, in particular the running of the commons. He determined the dates for seeding and harvest, he collects the rent on behalf of the lord, etc., etc. Now, apart from the Schulze, the priest and the free peasants, there would usually be an alehouse run by a brewer. Beer was taxed to the margraf. Full-time artisans in the village were still quite rare. Many villages would have a forge, an oven and other tools as communal spaces where peasants would be able to be their own smith, baker, and much more rarely candlestick maker. And finally, we have the lower classes. There are the free farm labourers who would often have a small dwelling with a garden to grow something for their own needs, but mostly they would be employed by the free peasants or a noble landlord. In these eastern villages, actual serfs obliged to do work on the master's lands were more rare. Fishing on the rivers was usually done by a former Slavic population who were sometimes relocated wholesale to live along the streams or rivers and fish for the lord. The Slavic population were generally not free and had no say in the management of these resources. To convince the free peasants to move to one of these new villages, they would often receive relief from these various duties, usually for a number of years, though rarely more than seven. That was not such a great deal in the mid-12th century, as the Saxon nobles occasionally started unnecessarily and badly prepared wars with the local Slavs, such as the Vendish Crusade. These unprovoked attacks resulted in an unsurprisingly large number of massacres of the colonists. But they prevailed over time, and their villages flourished, which had an effect even on the communities the colonists had left behind. Their landlords had to ease the burdens if they wanted to avoid their tenants leaving en masse. I am with Chris Wickham to say that economically, peasants in the 12th century Germany had it much better than 200 years earlier, and probably 200 years later. But all these are generalizations. In some villages, the local lords were squeezing the last drop of blood out of their peasants, whilst in others, they and their officials were totally lax. And things went in waves. At times, there was a lot of forest clearing or a huge expansion drive in the east, creating opportunities and easier conditions, followed by periods of relative stability and tightening rules. Now, economic conditions are one thing. But how did society work? As a family and inheritance, again, we look to the Sachsenspiegel for guidance. The Sachsenspiegel does provide a lot of detail about inheritance laws and the financial settlements if a marriage breaks up, including an annulment. It does, however, not describe the marriage itself. We know that by the 13th century, marriage has become a sacrament. And given we now have priests in most villages, marriages are concluded not necessarily in church, but by priests on the steps before the church. Marriage required consent of the bride in principle. But again, customs vary. The basic concept of the Sachsenspiegel is that women have no ability to lodge claims in court. Apparently a lady called Califunia had angered the emperor so much that he banned all women from appearing before his court to eternity. This story only appears here, nowhere else, no other sources. So, who knows where California comes from? But thanks to that lady's misdeeds, all girls and women need to have a legal guardian. Until marriage, that legal guardian is their father. Boys, on the other hand, are released from parental guardianship once they turn 12 or 13. Once a woman had married, she falls under the legal guardianship of her husband. She does, however, have rights against her husband, namely she can constrain his guardianship if he wastes her money or seriously mistreated her. But otherwise, he's pretty much in charge. Widows still need to have a legal guardian, usually a member of her family. That could mean that in case the older generation had died out, the son would become the legal guardian. And if there is nobody left, she is the subject to the guardianship of the king. She would, however, have ownership of her dowry and the mourning gift as well as the usufruct of her husband's property. 
In case the marriage is annulled, the former wife also receives her dowry and mourning gift back, but no benefits from her husband's property. She has to return into legal guardianship, though mercifully not to any member of her ex-husband's family. Children may stay with the mother, though that is not made explicit. The Sachsenspiegel is, however, not the only source of the law. It doesn't apply in southern Germany, where other traditions may have prevailed, and the city law codes often diverged, namely when it came to the role of women. In cities, widows would often take over their husband's business, or at least run them until such time the children were old enough to take over. That meant they had to be able to enter into contracts and acquire property. In some cities, women were allowed to start their own merchant businesses, which again required them to be exempt from the obligations of having a legal guardian. Marrying a widow was a way for an apprentice to become a member of the guild and thereby a master. And finally, aristocratic women could and did take charge of regency councils on behalf of their children. So as we see with landlord obligations, the medieval practice is variable, and what made the immutable rule in one place is not at all strict in the next. This is not a centralized state with rules that apply everywhere. Local custom is what prevails and what changes. And we're talking about a span of 350 years after all. One of the most famous customs is the saying, Stadtluft macht frei, urban air makes you free. This is the idea that once a serf had lived a year and a day in a city, he could no longer be claimed by his former master. This concept exists elsewhere in Europe, but is most prevalent in Central Europe, in particular in Germany. And that has to do with the way German cities have developed. In Italy, for instance, the ancient Roman cities continued to operate, first as seats of bishops and then later as the centers for both the local aristocracy and the emerging merchant class. Italian cities controlled the surrounding countryside, the contado, and had established social hierarchies, initially dominated by the local aristocratic landholders. As such, they had no interest in providing incentives for tenant farmers or serfs to flee into their cities. Now, Italy is an extreme example, but again, many French cities were also quite ancient. In Germany, there weren't many Roman cities. Cologne, Mainz, Trier, Augsburg, Regensburg and a few more, mostly located along the Rhine River. If you take the five largest German cities by size today, Berlin, Hamburg, Munich, Cologne, Frankfurt, Stuttgart, only Cologne has been founded as a city by the Romans. The rest date back to the Middle Ages. Between the year 1000 and 1300, the number of cities in Germany rises from 150 to 3000. Often, the cities are the brainchild of a local prince looking to improve the economy of his lands and maybe his income. Henry the Lion had founded Munich because he wanted to steal the commercial traffic from the Bishop of Freising and Lübeck to build a trading centre in his newly acquired territories. Some emerge around a major imperial castle, such as Nuremberg, Rothenburg and Magdeburg, and sometimes it's all a bit organic, as was the case with Berlin. The city of Freiburg in Breisgau, down in the southwest, most beautiful and my old alma mater, near the much older cities of Basel and Strasbourg, has long been regarded as one of the oldest foundation cities, with privileges going back to 1120 and some argue 1091. Freiburg was founded by the Dukes of Zeringen, a family we've come across before. The Zeringers are very active founders of cities. Bern, today's capital of Switzerland, Fribourg in Switzerland, Fillingen and Weilheim were all founded by them. Now the archives of Freiburg hold a document that sets out the terms of the foundations of the city, and it reads as follows. Quote, Let it be known to the living and future generations that I, Conrad, am establishing a market on my property, namely in Freiburg. Therefore, I would like to gather merchants from everywhere to settle here. I will allocate each merchant who comes here a plot of land on which he can build a house. In return, he and his children and children's children will pay me an annual interest as remuneration. I also promise the following rights, which I hereby certify and swear to observe for all time. 1. I promise that all who visit my market will receive peace and safe conduct. If anyone is robbed on the way to my market, I promise to return what has been robbed or to claim it from the robber. If one of my citizens dies, his family may keep the entire inheritance. All citizens of my city may use the common pasture land, rivers and lakes, 
forests and meadows on my property. I shall waive the customs duty for all merchants. My citizens may freely choose the bailiff, that's the manorial official, the representative of the feudal lord, and their priests. I confirm those elected by them in their office. Legal disputes between my citizens will not be decided by me, but will be negotiated independently according to the customary law of the merchants. Every citizen may freely sell his property if he so wishes. Anyone who comes to Freiburg may live here freely and safely. But if he is the serf of a lord, then that lord may take him again. If the serf denies that he belongs to that lord, the lord may prove this with seven witnesses. If, however, a serf lives in the city of Freiburg for a year and a day without being taken by a lord, then he shall be free. A citizen of the city of Freiburg is one who owns free property of at least one mark in value. In order that my citizens may believe that I will observe these rights, I swear with my twelve most prominent officials, with one right hand upon the sanctuaries of the saints, that I and my children and children's children will observe these rights forever. End quote. These privileges given to the men and women who decide to come to Freiburg are very generous, which suggests that Conrad, the brother of the then Duke of Zeringen, was under some pressure to get his little town going. Or, as some scholars suggested, the foundation document was at least partially a fake, claiming rights and privileges the citizens have gained later on. But whatever the precise details, these foundation cities were places that had to entice people to come and one of the incentives were more freedoms. For merchants and artisans, the key was justice, autonomy and protection against theft and robbery. For the urban poor, it was the relief from serfdom. It's unlikely that the serfs who made it to Freiburg and had stayed in hiding for a year and a day would quickly rise to prosperity. They're much more likely to just move into a different form of servitude, as domestic staff or day labourers but their sons and daughters or grandsons and granddaughters may rise in prosperity as the city grew and the opportunities popped up. You can see the key difference between German and Italian cities in the 13th century. The leadership of Italian cities were the aristocrats. They are the ones who built the many towers that gave these places the appearance of heavily armoured hedgehogs. The newly founded German cities did not attract aristocrats. Some explicitly banned them from living within their walls. Their leadership were the merchants and artisans. Only in the big episcopal centres of Cologne, Mainz, etc. did the ministeriales hold important positions, but again, no space for aristocrats. Aristocrats lived on their castles. Nor did the city serve as capitals for territorial lords as they did in France. The empire famously had no capital, so there is no equivalent of Paris. The seats of the important aristocrats were their great castles. Sometimes cities would grow up around these castles, such, for instance, Brunswick around Henry the Lion's palace, or Meissen, the seat of its margrave. These communities would serve the lord of the castle, but over time would shake off their links with the princes. A great example is Nuremberg, one's favourite castle of Conrad III, but by the 13th century the city and the burggrave were permanently at loggerheads. Pure capital cities like Karlsruhe, Mannheim, Dresden and Hanover with things for the distant future. Now, I fear I've strayed a bit beyond the topic that I wanted to cover with this episode, so next week we'll talk a bit more about the German cities in the 12th and 13th century, and then take a look at what happened to that great urge to reform the church that had dominated the 11th century. Did it disappear? No, not at all. But it stopped putting their hopes into the papacy, and looked for salvation from men and women who they believed to follow in the footsteps of the Apostles. Before I go, let me thank all of you who are supporting the show, in particular the patrons who have kindly signed up on patreon.com slash historyofthegermans. It's thanks to you that this show does not have to start with me endorsing mattresses or meal kits. If Patreon isn't for you, another way to help the show is sharing the podcast directly or boosting its recognition on social media. If you share, comment or retweet a post from the history of the Germans, it's more likely to be seen by others. Hence, bring in more listeners. My most active places are Twitter, at Germans History, and my Facebook page, History of the Germans Podcast. As always, all the links are in the show notes. 